11. We'll be starting in verse 29 this morning. In the time of his earthly ministry, our Lord Jesus knew the hearts of men. That's what the Bible tells us. He knew the hearts of men. Uh, and since he knew what was in people's hearts, he was not impressed by the big crowds that he was drawing. And his ministry was not altered by people's actions or their attitudes. Uh, the response of the crowds didn't sway him one way or the other. Just before the events and, and teaching in this morning's text, uh, the Lord had been dealing with some, some very hard hearts. Uh, the crowd had been witness to the miraculous deliverance and, and healing of a demon-possessed mute man, and, uh, and yet most of the people had just blown it off, or worse. Some had actually suggested that Jesus performed his miracles by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons, and then uh, others... Um, wanted another miracle. You know, they, others ignored the miracle that they saw completely, and they asked for a sign from heaven. Well, I don't know about you. I remember back in 2 Kings chapter 1, uh, remember Elijah? Elijah called down fire from heaven, and he incinerated a captain and his 50 men. And, and I think if I was Jesus, you know, I would have called down some fire and fried 100 people or so and said, there's your sign. Now pay attention. But fortunately, Jesus is not like that. Jesus is, is not like that, and that's not what he did. He, he actually reasoned with the people uh, very logically and mercifully. Um, even those people who said that he was in league with the devil. How do you do that? Well, he did. And uh, after reasoning with them, he also, you know, he, he uh, as he, as he, reason with him, he demonstrated the foolishness of their idea, and then he graciously warned them again, and he called them once again to repentance. Now in today's message, we find him dealing with the, uh, this stubborn request for more evidence, the, the miraculous sign that they wanted, and, and in doing this, Jesus used three illustrations to demonstrate the seriousness of these people's spiritual situation. First of all, uh, he reminded them, this is items one and two, he reminded them of two famous events in Jewish history where Gentiles responded to God's word, and that is in the accounts of Jonah and the Queen of Sheba. And then he used a third illustration from daily life that had to do with light. So let's go ahead and read this morning's text, uh, Luke chapter nine, uh, 11, verses 29 through 36. And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to, meet the, to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed... A greater than Solomon is here. The, women, the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. No one, when he has, a lit, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good... Your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this time. Lord, we thank you for your word. We love that you've given us your spirit. We love the, the fruit that he produces in us, Lord. We love the direction and guidance, the conviction. And yet so many times uh, in these frail bodies and in this fallen world, we get confused. We thank you for the objective truth of your word that we know uh, so many times exactly what you think and exactly what you're like and exactly what you want us to do. 
Thank you for this time that we have together to get into your word today. We pray that you'd be glorified and accomplish your perfect purposes. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Jesus began his illustrations that would involve um, despised Gentiles by telling his Jewish audience, this is a, an evil generation. And, and by that, he meant, and they knew he meant, all the Jews living at that time. And he went on. Verse, uh, the second part of verse 29, it seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. And you might remember that the Apostle Paul would say some years later, for Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But what was his response? He said, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. Now the Jews wanted a sign, but no sign was good enough. No sign was good enough because their hearts were hard. And they had... They had demonstrated this hard-heartedness really throughout the history of their nation. Now, Jonah, he was a Jew, right? And he was a prophet of God. He was a, he was a member of uh, the most blessed people who ever lived, uh, called into existence by God himself as his own special people, and, and they were greatly blessed. And, and, and Jonah was called by the one true living God, personally called by him to be his spokesman. And Jonah, Jonah knew what God was like, but what happened? When, when God called him to go minister to these idolatrous and brutal Ninevites, Jonah went the opposite direction. He didn't just linger around for a while and put things off. He went, the, he went running in the opposite direction. He, he headed to Tarshish, which was as far as you could go, uh, to, the, to the extreme west, probably an area in Spain. And we're familiar with the story, I think, all of us. Uh, Jonah went to Joppa, and he caught this uh, Gentile ship and headed off as fast and as far as he could go uh, from what God had called him to do. And then a storm arose, and, and the sailors were terrified, and eventually they were compelled to throw Jonah overboard, even though they didn't want to, because actually, as heathen Gentiles, they were still more merciful than Jonah. And Jonah was swallowed by the great fish, and he was... He was taken down to the very roots of the mountains, chapter 2, verse 6. He was basically, Jonah was basically entombed within this creature, uh, probably a whale or a whale shark, and he was taken down to the bottom of the sea. So Jonah was as good as dead. But then after three days and three nights, he repented, and he cried out to God, Jonah, in, in chapter Jonah, uh, chapter Two, verse 2 of, of Jonah, the, the New Living Translation reads, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. Then, as soon as he repented, the fish surfaced, and he barked Jonah out there on the beach, and, and then uh, the prophet went into Nineveh, and he preached, and this, this brutal people, this, this uh, pagan people, this almost inconceivably cruel people, which we won't go into today, they repented. He preached and they repented, all of them. They listened to God's word and they received it and they, they turned from their wickedness and from their gods to the one true living God. Now, I've heard and I've taught before um, acknowledging that it's a bit speculative I've taught that Jonah showed up close to Nineveh there after the, the whales had him out. He showed up there mostly naked, hairless, bleached by the whale's gastric juices and covered with whale puke. And of course that is speculative, I confess that. But now look at this, the Ninevites, we know what the Ninevites were like. The Ninevites believed the sign, we're told. The Ninevites believed the sign that Jonah had been in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, or else they would not have listened to him. And Jesus would not have said that he was a sign to the Ninevites. So something got their attention. 
Jesus says in verse 30 that Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. So Jonah was a sign past tense, and Jesus would be in actually the very near future. And, and when he used this illustration in chapter 12 of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Uh, it's the resurrection of Jesus after his crucifixion and three days and nights in the grave that proves that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, the preaching alone, um, in a sense, was a ministry validating sign, right? Um, in the case of Jonah and in the case of Jesus. I mean, you might remember that, that John the Baptist messengers... Uh, uh, back way early uh, in, the, in the book, uh, John the Baptist messengers um, went to Jesus looking for evidence and find to ask him a question, right? And, and they went back to John saying, the poor have the gospel. Jesus told them to go back say, and say, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And, and that was one of the signs that Jesus gave based on the Old Testament prophecy to encourage John while he was in prison. So, so in a sense, the preaching itself is a sign, but, but the three days and nights, both in Jonah's case and in Jesus' case, are the focus here. Jonah's quasi-resurrection is the sign. The sign validated the preaching of the word. Okay? The sign, just like the other miracles of Jesus, validated what, what he taught. And then Jesus went on in verse 31. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. The queen of the south is sometimes called the queen of Saba, uh, but most of us know her as the queen of Sheba. And uh, in fact, I venture to guess most of the people you know have heard of the Queen of Sheba, right? They may not know anything about her, but they've heard of the Queen of Sheba. Uh, and Sheba was a, a kingdom that stretched from, from southwest Arabia to uh, all the way over to, uh, uh, to what was then Ethiopia, just north of uh, the Horn of Africa. Probably uh, it contained parts of Ethiopia and Djibouti and Somalia and Eritrea and Sudan. It was big big place. And this queen traveled with a caravan a distance of over a thousand miles, uh, maybe 1,400 miles, over, over a period of many months to seek the wisdom of Solomon. And, and now it's important to remember that the Ninevites who responded to Jonah were Gentiles and uh, pagans of the worst sort, and the queen of Sheba, also a Gentile. But when Jonah preached to the Gentiles in Nineveh, they believed. They responded. They repented. They turned to God, and God spared them. Now, Jonah might have looked really funny, and, and it seems that his message re revealed something about his journey uh, rather than just judgment in 40 days. But the only message that we're told about is, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 40 days and you're toast, and that's it. No other message that we're told about, but... But he is. Uh, we know that the resurrect, uh, the uh, uh, him being in the fish was a sign. But just that, just that, and Nineveh, this hard-hearted, cruel people, repented, and it says all of them repented. And the queen of Sheba, uh, she had not heard about miracles of healing. When she came all this way, she hadn't heard about healing. She hadn't heard about miracles of raising people from the dead. She, she heard about the great wisdom of Solomon, the king. And, and she saw Solomon's great works of architecture. And she saw this, his, this incredible wealth that he had amassed. And she, she heard his wisdom. She was greatly impressed. There weren't any miracles. And, and yet, this great Gentile queen also responded to the word of God. She marveled at the wisdom of Solomon, which was, of course, the wisdom of God, and she believed it. She believed it with just that evidence. But, but she, she believed in the wisdom of God that came from a man, from, from Solomon. Jesus Christ is wisdom. Jesus Christ is wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1.30. Paul refers to him as 
Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2, um, verse uh, 2. Christ is greater than, than either Jonah or Solomon, by far. Christ is far greater. Now, God established his covenant with Abraham way back when, right? It was, it was about 1950 B.C. We, some of us remember 1950, uh, 80, but 1950 B.C. is about the time uh, God uh, established the covenant with Abraham. And Israel was born about 1790 uh, B.C., and then the law was given to Moses maybe about 1500 B.C., uh, the point is that by the time of Jesus, God's people had existed as his own people for about 2,000 years. And they had possessed his law for about 1,500 years. And they'd been performing the sacrifices and hearing his written word and the, and the words of the prophets, one prophet after another for generations. And in Jesus, their Messiah had been in public ministry for about three years, and he's doing incredibly, incredible uh, totally unprecedented signs and wonders. And he's living a sinless, exemplary life. But the Jews wouldn't believe. They wouldn't believe. Jesus made clear what they should have known and accepted. A greater one than Solomon was in their presence. A greater one than Solomon was there. The greatest man... Whoever lived, in fact, was there doing the greatest signs that anyone had ever done. And this was all in, in clear fulfillment of the prophecies that they said they believed. And they still wouldn't accept it. And so Jesus said, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment and the men, uh, with the men of this generation, and she'll condemn them. And the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment, these Gentiles, right? with this generation and condemn it at the judgment. They, these people, these Jews, were without excuse, totally. God had already given them everything they could possibly need. And, and on the day of judgment, those people are going to have no defense at all. And what will the people of our age say at the judgment? Because you can be guaranteed that many of our generation will be standing before him at the great white throne judgment. How are they going to defend themselves? The sign that was given to the Ninevites and to the Jews, as I said, was Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And, and you know, um, that's really all people need. That's really all people need. It's, it's the center of our, it is the core of our message, yours and mine. Uh, Paul said, for I delivered, and we read it this morning, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. That's the gospel. The good news. And when people hear that, see, it's not like you and I are, who are familiar with it. I mean, it is good news, but when people hear that, they should be shocked and they should be worried and they should be convicted right there at the outset and they should ask, what do you mean Christ died for my sins? What sins? Most of them are going to say that, right? What did I do? I'm better than them. I'm better than him. I'm better than this guy. I bet I'm better than you. What sins? Died? What do you mean died? What must I do to be saved? That's the response. And then we can tell them, repent and believe in the gospel. Mark 1, verse 15. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's, that's the, the correct challenge and the, the blessing, the, the good news and the response. The Jews had tremendous privilege, but we have accounts of Christ's death and burial and resurrection in four gospels. Four gospels. And we've got, we, we basically... Uh, we have what's uh, a detailed analysis and explanation and application uh, in the writings of Peter and Paul and John. We have more history uh, from Luke. We've got 2,000 years of, of church history and the writings and the wisdom of godly men throughout that time. We've got the Holy Spirit working in and through and among us. We've got churches on every corner. We've got 
uh, signs out every Sunday morning, and a lot of them are up all week. We got Bibles, we've got TV, radio, the internet. And so we have a great responsibility. We have a great responsibility, and the people around us are accountable for the light they have. All of us are accountable for the light we have, and that brings us to the next illustration. Jesus wrapped up this discourse. It's really almost half the discourse, but he wrapped this up by once again using light as a as a metaphor for truth. And it's you know it's something that's I'd say it's not uncommon in the scripture. It's, I think it's more than that. It's it's fairly common actually to to see him use light as uh, as representative of the truth. And and you know we even saw him, him uh, use this in, in chapter eight verse sixteen of this gospel. And of course it's in the Sermon on the Mount and in other places, and of course, um, this is not now, he's been using these illustrations from history, this is not a historical uh, reference, this is, a, this is an illustration from life that's meaningful in any age, to any person. Light and darkness in the physical world help us to understand light and darkness in the spiritual world. Now, God's truth is a light that shines in the darkness of this world. Uh, you might write down Psalm 119, verse 105, Proverbs 6, 23. Of course, it's other places. So God's truth is a light that shines in the darkness of this world. But it is not enough for the light to be shining all around us for it to do us any good. That's not enough. The light has to enter us. The light has to enter us. You, you can go to church seven days a week. You can be in the light, right? In the presence of God's truth all day long, every day, and have it not do you a bit of good. Doesn't do you a bit of good. The light has to get inside you. The light has to get inside you. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Someone has said, the brightest sun cannot enable a blind man to see. And that's what we see with this crowd around Jesus. Verse 33 says, no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. It's a waste of time, I think all of us know, to, to put a lamp in a cellar or a crypt, which is more literally what the, the Greek word means here. Um, you wouldn't put a, a lamp in one of those places, a cellar or a crypt, and, and you wouldn't put one under a basket. It's foolishness. You put a, a candle or a lamp on some elevated uh, visible surface where you can see it and where, where, the, where the light illuminates the surroundings. And probably the point here is that it would have made no sense for Jesus to withhold any evidence from the people, right? He knew the light that he was giving had to get to the people. He knew they needed the light, right? He wasn't hiding anything. And so that's the point here. It would have made no sense for him to withhold this evidence, to hide it under a bushel. They, they already had, and so they already had plenty of light. They didn't need more. In fact, far more than the Ninevites, far more than the Queen of Sheba, but the light has to be allowed to shine, not covered up. And then he went on, the lamp of the body is the eye, therefore when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light, but when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Now, this is the real part of the issue. The, the problem is not Again, a lack of light. The problem is not a lack of light. Jesus is the light of the world. God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, right? The problem is a lack of sight. It's not a lack of light, it's a lack of sight. Spiritually blind people are people who refuse to see the light. It shines, they refuse to see it. For over Three years at this point, the people of Israel had experienced a, a, a virtual tsunami of light, right? Jesus had flooded the nation with light. Um, everyone knew who he was. It was 
inconvenient, right? The light was inconvenient to them. The light was even offensive to them. The, the leaders considered themselves to be uh, guides to the blind, but Jesus called them blind guides. They were blinded by their pride. They were blinded by their hatred of Jesus, and they were they were blinded by their hatred of the truth itself. Uh, in John, John's Gospel, chapter three, verses nineteen through twenty, Jesus said, "And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men loved." darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed people don't want to be exposed in all their dirty little secrets they want to justify the things that are public now they, they find strength in numbers more and more right and so people people uh, rally people to their cause and broadcast you know their sins and try to make them like their virtues of some kind now in his illustration Jesus speaks of the eye as as a lamp that either illuminates the body or not but <clears throat> excuse me maybe maybe it's easier for us to understand this as, as the body being our house Okay, and the eyes being windows rather than than the lamps. The, and, and the Lord's metaphor, the eye, uh, isn't really the lamp of the body in the first place in, in the way that we would think of it. Uh, in other words, it's not the light itself. He's not saying that the light is the same as it has been. The light is the truth of God's word. Okay, the light's the truth of God's word, and the eye is a lamp, uh, a little more on the order of a lantern. Right, perhaps where a light comes through a pane of glass on one side of the lantern. I've got one on my coffee table. Right, we have one on our coffee. It's not mine, but it's got four sides there. Right, and it's like the light comes through that pane. If it was dirty, like the the uh, oil lamps we have downstairs, you know, from um, um, last time the power went out and we were down there, you know, it's. Uh, then they get all smoky and it obscures the light. They don't put out very much light very far. So, so this is like the light coming through uh, a pane of glass on, on one side of a lantern in our world. They, they didn't have lanterns or glass in, in Jesus' day, but, but that's what this is like. There's a, there's a, there is a, uh, a lens or a window that the light has to come through. And our eyes are this lens. And so in this way, the, the amount of light that gets into the body depends on just how clear the eye is, right? Just like the, just like the lens, the, the, like the lamp I was talking about. The amount that gets in depends on how, how clear the glass is. And, you know, the, the, the Greek word that's translated clear in the, in the New American Standard and, and good in most of the others means... Uh, good or sound or clear. It doesn't really mean healthy so much, but good or sound or clear. If, if the eye is clear, light comes in, it floods the whole body, and the physical world, you know, is a, is a good illustration for the spiritual uh, application. If, if, if your eye is sound, the light comes in, you, and you know where to step, right? You know where to step, you know what to take hold of, you know where it is. Spiritual light, when it comes in, informs all of our thinking. When spiritual light comes in, it informs all of our thinking with the wisdom of God. The light enters the brain through the eye, and it brings understanding of everything that the light illuminates. But if your eye's bad, well, the, the light can't come in, right? And your body will be full of darkness. And, and the idea spiritually, you know, is, is the bad eye is one that's darkened by sin and evil, and again, in a physical sense, if we wear sunglasses in the house, right, or something like that, you, uh, we can't see clearly or at all, and we're going to stumble. Uh, and this speaks of an obstacle to the entrance of light. And I know it sounds kind of silly to have to elaborate to that degree, but, but I used this illustration about the sunglasses because this condition of the eye being bad or evil 
it's not completely passive, like we just had a disease. That's why I mentioned what the word really means. It's not like we're, it's just an unhealthy eye in that respect. Um, we can't do anything about it. It's not like we were just born with a defective eye. Um, then we have to wait passively and hope something changes. Verse 35 says, take heed. It says, watch out. Make sure that the light which is in you is not darkness. And so don't be deceived. Don't kid yourself. And for crying out loud, do something about it. So it's not just a passive thing. And that's why I say, so we uh, wear dark glasses in the house spiritually. There are things where we don't want the light shining in, even as believers. Every one of us comes into this world spiritually dead and separated from God and we're blind to spiritual things. But I quoted to you John chapter 3 verses 19 through 20 just a little bit ago and that speaks of our love of the darkness. Our love of the darkness and our hatred of the light. And not only do we start life in that blind condition, but we like it. We, we hate light. We love the darkness because we enjoy our evil deeds, and we certainly don't want to experience shame or injustice or anything like that, or justice. I mean, I, we, we kind of revel in injustice for us. We, we don't want it, you know, we don't want to be called to account for our sins, is the point, right? We don't want them exposed, and we don't want to have to pay for the things that we're doing wrong. All these things, though, don't stop God from shining His light on us. No matter how resistant we might be, they don't, they don't stop Him from shining His light on us. He desires that none would be lost, but that all would come to repentance. And so He shines the light, and God has always had preachers, right? He's always had preachers. He's had for many ages now His written word as well. And he even speaks to us through the creation, the Bible says in Romans. And we can respond to that light, even if it's a faint glimmer coming through our darkened window, or we can resist the light, and we can darken it still further. Now, Jesus knew that the temptation for a lot of people in his crowd would be to say, no way, not dark in here. Right? People will delude themselves. People will lie to themselves. I mean, um, I remember a church that we used to go to. It wasn't a Christian church. But people were just radiant a whole lot of times because they were self-deluded and they would talk about, you know, like more, it was like more meta than just metaphorically about the light in themselves. Uh, People will lie to themselves. They'll deceive themselves. We are naturally inclined as human beings to resist the truth. And it's only the Holy Spirit and God's Word that keep us from, from living there. This is, you know, sometimes kind of hard for us to see in ourselves. And I think it's, it's easier to see it in somebody else or maybe some circumstance that, like what I was just talking about, something that maybe we don't have too much to do with. I think of a way... Um, way back when, when I sobered up from alcohol and, and drugs and, and we went for a while to a church called Unity. One time this was called the Unity Church of our School of Christianity. I can't remember now, it's just Unity Church, I think. Uh, for a while though, while I was there, I was able to tell myself, I'm okay. I'm spiritually good, I'm a good person. I, you know, I wasn't, I'm not drinking anymore. I'm going to church. I'm trying to live a better life. And we even talk about Jesus. And, and you, know, you know, at the same time, we don't quibble about the little things, like who's the greatest. And, and by that, I mean not, you know, you or me. I mean, we didn't talk about who's the greatest between Jesus or Muhammad or the Buddha because they were all master teachers. And so you didn't have things to fight about with other people, right? It's all nice and peace and love and stuff like that. Uh, I never heard anything about sin, it was great. I felt good. I had one tape I just used to play over and over and over and over in the car, play it at home, stuff like that. I felt good. It was wonderful. And I rejected things like the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There wasn't any need for that. 
And if you talk to me about sin, I said, as Mary will tell you, judge not lest ye be judged. Judge not lest ye be judged. Take it completely out of context. But I felt good about myself. I deceived myself. I didn't let that light, like I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Didn't let that come in. Didn't let that repent thing come in. See, we need to pay attention. We need to examine ourselves, and we need to make sure that we are not deceiving ourselves about what God is telling us. We need to make sure that the light within us is not really darkness, verse 35. We delude ourselves, even as believers. And you know, you've probably done it yourself, but if not, you've got friends that do. And some of them, it's terrifying to see the way they are leading, uh, wrecking their lives. And, and perhaps, you know, we wonder whether they're ever really saved or not from the way they're living. And of course, you know, this applied to all those people in the multitude listening to Jesus, most of them whom were not saved. And they were resisting Jesus. And he's preaching. They're, they're getting the truth. They're getting light. And they're resisting. But it applies to us believers as well because Paul tells us about how the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh for these things are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. We don't do the things that we want. Now, there are plenty of times in each of our lives when we resist God's light shining into our hearts. And, and by the time we've been believers for a while, my experience is that we're usually pretty adept at deflecting when we want to. Now, it doesn't mean that God is fooled by it, but we can certainly fool ourselves and maybe sometimes fool other people. So, so we get good at deflecting and, and you know, when we're confronted and we're convicted by God's word, we find ways around it. You know, it, believers evade God's word and they even twist scriptures and pull them out of context to defend their behavior when they know full well what they're doing. I've known people, some Christians, for many, many, many years, and they go to this conference, that conference, they study the Bible, they do their daily, but they see something shiny and they want it. And all of a sudden, after all those years of listening to apologetics ministry and stuff, they start ripping words out of context. Right? They just twist things to suit because they, they like what they're doing. They don't like the light shining on them. And what do they do? It's like some of the young teenage kids have done since the 70s. Get up and paint the windows black. Paint the windows black and the light can't get in. We don't have to deal with it. And Jesus, Jesus warns us against self-deception. And what we need to battle against that as believers is really Acts 2.42, you know? I mean, we could say John 15 is the, is the simplest thing, abiding in Christ. The simplest way we can look at it. If we're really close to Jesus, if we linger with him, tarry with him, abide with him, you know, then we're going to stay open to the light. And, you know, we're going to constantly produce fruit as the Spirit works within us. But one thing that helps all of us, and it helps us to, to uh, serve God better, is, uh, again, Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. You know, the, that was what the early church did all the time. They were together, and they, they focused on the Word. They focused on prayer, they focused on fellowship, and they focused on worship. And these things cultivate and nurture within us the spiritual life to where we're receptive to the Word. Or we're receptive to it. And we know immediately when we're wrong. And then some of our friends in fellowship shake us till our teeth rattle when, when we, we try to go off and take things out of context and do what we want, right? And we love them for it because we need it. Verse 36 says, Then if your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. I like the way the New Living Translation translates verse 36. It says, If, if then your whole body is full of light, having no dark part, the whole body will be full of light, 
as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Um, if we purpose in our hearts to keep our windows clean, to keep our eye clean, as it were, if we, if we do those things that are necessary, like, again, continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, the breaking of bread prayers, then the light of God's word, his truth, will flood our souls and nothing will stay hidden that he wants to be revealed. Nothing will stay hidden that he wants to be revealed. A lot of people are still trying to find out what's wrong with them and why they live defeated lives after 35, 40 years of walking with the Lord. There's no reason for that. God will reveal that as his light comes in. It will expose the bad intentions, um, the faulty desires or values or agendas. Uh, those things, you know, uh, are not going to remain hidden when his light comes in. His light will illuminate every part of our souls and we will actually know our own hearts. We'll know our own minds. We'll know our own motivations. What really makes me tick? Why do I do this? And the things that hinder us from doing what's right, we're gonna, we'll see our shortcomings and our strengths. God knows about all of these things himself anyway, and he wants to expose them for us. He wants to shine his light on them. And he wants to Again, expose them and, and root out. He wants us to root out the bad things in our lives. Not to shame us, not to hurt us, but for our good and for his glory. And so Jesus challenged his listeners, and he challenges us today to let the light of God's revelation saturate our souls and, and reveal to us everything that's inside here. We get to judge ourselves so that he will not have to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for your word because as we are just talking about now, Lord, um, we are so easily deluded by, by uh, people and even ourselves. And uh, we need uh, your truth in an objective form, Lord, uh, that we can look to it and, and, uh, and experience uh, conviction and experience the, the relief of, of new direction and and comfort and encouragement, Lord. Uh, we thank you that you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And as we gather here today and, and we worship and study your, your word, Lord, uh, it's our desire that we'd be fruitful for you, and, and it's our desire that those family members and our friends and co-workers and neighbors, Lord, who uh, are deluding themselves, Lord, that they would they'd be saved. We want them to be saved, Lord. And so we pray that you'd direct us and guide us in how we can, how we can reach them. That you would, that you would rescue them uh, uh, through our efforts, Lord. Go before us this week, Lord. Be glorified in every part of our lives. Help us to be fruitful for you. And commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing.